Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this edition of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefield and you're probably expecting this. I'm going to talk about namaste and in la catch for just a moment. Namaste comes from an ancient language called Sanskrit. Spoken it's called it's known as Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch comes from the other side of the world, just as ancient, from the Mayan civilization, and it means I am another you. So here's a couple of ancient civilizations, both sides of the world, or on opposite sides of the world, that are saying basically the same thing. How do you think we can learn from that? And if we could, and had that perspective within each of us, and addressed others in like mind, what kind of difference would that make in our lives? We need that today. Try it. See what happens. Don't believe me? Test it for yourself. All right? Thanks. So this week's guest is Neil Elliott. He is a managing partner and consultant with Fourth Wall Consulting. He's the author of A Higher Road, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. He's kind of an innovative operations executive and project leader, and he likes making or solving business hurdles and slicing costs to make effectiveness a little better in the industry. But that's really not all he does. The guy is really pretty conscious and we're going to find out just how much. So Dean, oh, here we go again. D, uh, Elliot, glad to have you here. Oh, Zen, thank you so much. And uh, we'll just clear everything up with everybody. So it's D, Neil Elliot, and the D is to differ is the initial for my first name and to differentiate me as an author and on the internet. Other okay, than that, so I go by gonna, Neil. We're just going to call you a differentiator. How's that? Well, <laughs> uh, might be for the D. Neil might be easier. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, uh, appreciate your time and your energy, and I'm really looking forward to diving deep with you. And so let's do that. So with your your book, I know that called the Higher Road that. You, you explore other areas, but it, as far as the internal aspects of life and, and how those correlate, when did you first begin to notice uh, a difference or, or even uh, uh, an experience of an inner life that had a significance in your life? And that's a, that's a good differentiator because we all have this inner life but we don't necessarily recognize these differences, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say that it was about probably close to 12 months after I began the seven-step process to uh, experience the spiritual awakening. And, uh, and that's really when I really could uh, actually say with full confidence that this body is not our reality our soul is our reality this body is merely a rented vehicle to help our soul learn the lessons that it wants to learn in this school we call earth good good now i, I often wonder because I, I through my own experience i had as a teenager i, I had the question of um, you know I, I, what truth is and i was willing to die for it if necessary and, and a few days later, 11, 11, 1975, by all indicators, I did. I was asked if I was willing to die for what I believed in and had to think, uh, okay, what, what do I believe in, right? Christ consciousness was the first thing. It felt a little empty, so I passed on it. And, but the cosmic consciousness is where I landed and it felt full. So I said yes. And pretty soon I ended up, uh, had an out-of-body experience, went into light, went beyond it into a indigo background with points of light surrounding me, was told what their function was with me in, in this life. And then I came back into my body and I, there were two things that I got out of that immediately. One, because I was thinking and analyzing the process, I knew I wasn't dead, right? Because I still had an individuated consciousness in the light, even though it felt like it was part of a oneness, right? And it had this iridescent, effervescent, high-pitched sensation to it that some may just call home right and then the other thing was that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form just unaware 
And those points of light are where we connect. And those points of light bounce back and forth between here and the great light for however many times we need to in order to get the memo right, of what we are capable of in full consciousness, where the lessons are essentially more about how to integrate the larger aspects of our being as opposed to life lessons as far as relationships or working in the world or something like that. Is that kind of where you were at and in, in how you were talking about the soul's relationship? Um, so uh, <clears throat> I was referring specifically when I first kind of had this okay. uh, experience, but now that I've been into this for four years, I can, I can talk about it and I'll talk about it using different language and in a different way, but we're probably saying the same thing. Okay, and we'll be able to corroborate that just in yeah. our conversation. You know, the, yeah, absolutely. The the, I had a, a mentor who's 20 years my senior. Um, he was the president of the Association for Alternate Dispute Resolution in America for some time. And he says, you know, there really is no conflict. There's just misunderstanding. Because you come to the table with two different dictionaries and you speak and listen from yours without understanding the others. And so the objective in conversation is to learn each other's dictionaries and be able to learn how to speak the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, and that's a good observation, isn't it? Yeah, because we Absolutely. all do that. Yeah. yeah, it creates psychological safety and, and intellectual humility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, okay, well, let's... Uh, yeah, continue. Okay, uh, so where do I start here? You know, um, let's talk about the soul and the soul's journey. Okay. And then, and then we can come back to, I'd like to talk about uh, consciousness on its own. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and that's probably a starting point. But let's talk about the soul and the soul's journey. Can I interrupt so, for just a moment? And, and let's go back just a little bit further to when you were younger and maybe some of the highlights of the points of logic or points of order that once you gained your awareness that you picked up on. And, and the oh, okay. that you might be yeah, able okay. to share with the audience as to what might be happening for them too. Yeah, so um, I'm going to take a drink of water, and then sure. I'm going to then I'm then I'll go through a little history, and I'll tell you how and why I got to where I am now. Wonderful. That might that might be benefit. Yeah, that works to begin with, and and it will give the audience a, a better foundation from which to hear you from. Yeah, and this is all outlined in my book, by the way. So the book is really around the process that I went through to get where I am today. And okay. it's uh, this logical, rational, based in science project that bridges this gap between spirituality and science. Awesome. I love that topic. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're that's where we're going to go in this conversation. But, you know, essentially, so I was born in 1960, youngest of six kids. My father passed away when I was five. My mom had to go get a job. She, there was no life insurance, and she had to go get a job immediately, obviously, to look after six kids. And um, <clears throat> she fortunately had a home economics degree. That's what it was called back then. Right. But was a stay-at-home mom. She worked. She graduated from university, worked for a year in a uh, deaf-blind and uh, mute school, and that's what they called it back then. That's a and, fascinating experience in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, I think as her first teaching job, right? And so um, <clears throat> anyway, so she had some experience as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, then she's looking after the six kids, stay-at-home mom. My father passed away. So he passed away July 4th. And uh, she, after two weeks after he was buried, she... Uh, started a summer school program to get her teaching certificate. But fortunately, back then, she could start teaching in September of that year, uh, even without this teacher certificate, because she had a university degree. So yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. so bottom bottom line is, uh, you know, my grandmother looked after me and, and um, you know, kind of grew up and adopted these patterns of thinking and feeling. So I'll, I'll just back up a moment. So we're going to talk about how we create every event and every experience that comes into our lives through our thinking and our feeling. So we come in with a plan. Our soul comes in with a plan. And then uh, from babyhood to age five or so, we're really, we're just these little sponges that soak everything up. We soak up 
all the emotions around us, the language, the religion, the culture, whatever our parents are doing, we're just soaking that up. That's starting to shape our personality for that lifetime with our goals that we come in and with. And uh, at age five, the brain develops to where it can start to make its own decisions. So it starts to get, um, <clears throat> you know, used to making its own decisions. So it's already had some stuff it came in with. It's already being shaped and influenced by its environment. And then it starts to make its own decisions. And as we grow from babyhood to adulthood, we think we're becoming versed in the ways of the world. But what we're really doing is shutting our soul off from the light. We're binding it down with our patterns of thinking and feeling. And those patterns of thinking and feeling that many of us and most of us adopt are contrary to where we come from and to where we return. We come from unconditional love. We return to unconditional love. But everything that we think and do that is contrary to that creates these bondages of, uh, of the soul to shut it off from the light. So I develop these patterns of thinking, uh, as we all do, and reinforce them. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> got an engineering degree, got an MBA, and, uh, and, you know, in the working world. And in the 90s, I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm looking after projects and I'm thinking, I'm dealing with a lot of people and I'm thinking, um, I'd like to have a more open attitude, you know, because of course I knew what was right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's true and false. Right. And right. <laughs> as we all do, right? Yeah, it's and, intrinsic uh, to our nature, I think. Even, absolutely. Even if the soul's shut off or, or <laughs> unavailable, there's still those things that are just, they're knowable. Well, yeah, so let's, we'll talk about that. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, of course I, I developed these patterns of thinking, feeling beliefs. And, um, so then I thought I'd like to have this more inclusive attitude. So I picked up, you know, spiritual books, you know, Wayne Dyer, Tony Robbins, Napoleon Hill, those kinds of things. And they all had great processes and stuff. And I was trying to fundamentally shift how I thought. Now I did that in the nineties and I couldn't fundamentally shift how I thought because the things that we have programmed in our subconscious mind are like concrete. You need a, a, a process to break them up and dissolve them. You need a jackhammer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, so in the end, the ego wins and, uh, now you can, we, we are great actors in our environment. We can project whatever we want into our environment and uh, not really, ex you know, expose the truth of what we're really thinking or feeling in a moment. Uh, and we do that with everybody. And um, so I became more inclusive and stuff. So I would accept other people's different opinions. I wouldn't really believe it or necessarily agree with it, but I could accept it and knew I had to negotiate with that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so I, I did this, but what happened from 2002 to 2015, I just slowly drove myself into this really deep and dark depression. And in 2015, I realized I was there. So I, I picked up some newly issued spiritual books going through the same process. None of that in a two year period worked. I just could not get out of this depressed state I was in and no one knew my wife didn't know my family didn't know. Mm, and, um, vulnerable <clears throat> enough to share now, were you? No, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, in 2017, um, I, our house sold after being on the market for five years, my wife got on a plane. There's an old, uh, early November, 2017, my wife got on a plane to go to visit family and friends in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We were in this little rental one bedroom apartment in the city. And, uh, I sat down at the kitchen table and I crafted my suicide note and I planned out my suicide and I planned it out for three months. Yeah. That's some deep, dark stuff. Yeah. So, um, I thought, okay, you know, uh, I want to make sure my wife's going to be okay. Financially. Okay. I want to say goodbye to family and friends without them knowing what I was going to do. But a week prior to that. So I'm going to back up this little step here, but a week prior to that, I received some information in this really fortuitous fashion, um, that promised to liberate me from my thinking if I followed it. And, um, but prior to that, the last book I read of these spiritual books, 
I read a near-death experience about a woman who had suffered from four years of this aggressive cancer. And uh, she, her body was riddled from her waist to her head with these uh, tumors, some the size of uh, lemons. And they, she had these open, weeping lesions in her body, dripping toxins. Mm -hmm. She fell in, she, her body weight went from a normal body weight to 75 to 90 pounds, something like that. She couldn't lift her head on her own. She required care 24 seven on oxygen 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. She fell into a coma. They rushed her to the hospital. The admitting physicians told her husband and family uh, she wouldn't make it through the night. Need to say she bye woke, bye. Yeah. She woke up 24 hours later, declared she was going to be okay. And within two weeks, they couldn't find a trace of cancer in her body. Her book, so that's all documented in the hospital records. So her, so because I'm an engineer, I like things that are, you know, you can observe, measure, calculate. <laughs> yeah, and then things Document. that have metrics, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this, although it wasn't explainable, it was factual because it's documented. She came back with certain messages. So she came back with these messages of her experience in this 24 hour period. You know, a couple of them were, we come from love, we return to love. Uh, she felt like she was becoming part of everything in the universe, be it a rock, a tree, a plant, planet, another person. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, we're not judged after death. I didn't understand it, but I could believe it. And what her book did to me, I had this little nagging, even though I grew up agnostic, I had this little nagging Christian doubt that if I committed suicide, I'd go to a bad place, I'd be judged, it would not be a good thing. Yeah. I read her book and I glommed on to that. We're not judged after death. That gave me permission to sit down and craft that suicide note. Okay. Then a week before I sat down at the table, I got this new information. So I decided what I'd do is I'd, I'd give it one last chance. I was looking for any kind of sliver of hope to hang on, to keep going. And so I, um, I thought, okay, well, I'll push out the suicide being an engineer, plan this out, I'll push it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll study this if it works great. And if it doesn't, I can pull the trigger. And uh, so I studied it, I began this process. A year to the day I woke up, my depression was totally gone. I was full of this inner peace and love and joy. And I felt totally prosperous and abundant. Nothing had changed in my environment. But that's how I felt. It was a total transformation of consciousness by your choice by my choice but also even though think, you may not have recognized it in the moment you were just looking for some relief yes well um it's all of that's true uh i learned some new knowledge and i followed this process um and I went into two meditations, that, uh, so 13 months after I began this process, I went into two meditations that were two days apart. And uh, I got into the meditation, meditation, and uh, you go through these higher vibrational, yeah, exactly. No medication, just meditation. And I, I went into um, these higher vibrational frequencies of consciousness, and this spiritual energy uh, flowed in through my head, it, it filled my body, then it enveloped my entire body. And I just felt bathed in unconditional love. And, it, and it's an unconditional love we can't explain. We don't have the human language to describe it. Let me ask you this, as far as a descriptor, at least sensory wise, I, I mentioned my own experience and, and how being in the light felt iridescent, effervescent and, and really high pitched sensation. Did you notice anything like that or was your awareness in a different place uh let me describe it this way and we'll see what matches for me so okay. for me i just i just felt totally enveloped in unconditional love i felt non-judged i didn't care what aches and pains my body had i didn't care what illnesses i had i didn't care what anybody had done to me in the past or what i had done to anybody i just felt totally supported now higher frequency absolutely because uh as you go through this process what you do is you you learn to access these higher frequencies of consciousness 
So our creator, whether you call it God, Yahweh, the Tao, call it whatever you want, our creator uh, is in silence and stillness and equilibrium. And it is these opposing impulses, this is before the Big Bang, it's these imposing impulses. And science will never be able to probe space and discover it because it is in the silence and stillness and equilibrium. At the time of the Big Bang, these impulses were ripped apart, and we see them as electromagnetism. And um, the, in order for you to get access to the source of our being, to allow your source of being to actually enter into you and to make itself known to you, it is such a high frequency of vibration, so spiritually refined, that even though it is it is radiating unconditional love to everything in creation, every moment of the day. It cannot make itself known to you until you start to raise your vibrational frequency of your human consciousness to be able to accept it and feel it and experience it. And when you go through this process to do this, then the uh, universal consciousness can make itself known to you, can support you, can guide you, can direct you, and can fill you with uh, every aspect of its being. Mm -hmm. And so that's the process that, that I went through. And I had two of these two days apart. And so as soon as I had those two experiences, I knew that the new knowledge I gained and that the process I followed was all absolutely true. And, um, you know, that is unshakable for me. Sure. You, you know, you talk about earlier. Well, that's a visceral you know, experience you cannot deny. Um, exactly. You know, I, you mentioned the, the early childhood development and the, up to five years. I, you know, I mentioned I was orphaned and adopted. The, and I'm just, I'm sharing this in reflection of what you said and, and looking for um, possibly some corroboration or offering some in, in yet another way. And that is that, at four and a half, my parents brought home my adopted sister. Different parents, of course, she was adopted. There was no process. And they felt like I was intelligent enough to understand what adoption was about. And so they shared with me what that was. And that, I, you know, I had no, I felt unconditional love from them. There was no question. I had no doubts at all. And yet, by knowing that, there were a few questions that came up. One was, who are my real parents? And another one, which was a little odd for such a young one, but I had had some experience in church already and, and kind of got the framework. I wondered if there was, if I had a father and mother in heaven and could I talk to them? So a few months later, I had this experience. I was... Uh, standing on the stairwell or on the landing of the stairwell, looking out through a window on our front porch. I had my elbows in the windowsill and, and my chin on my hands. And it was after dark, I was waiting for dad to come home from the store. And all of a sudden I hear this loud booming voice and it simply says, hey, you. And it was so loud that I just knew that my mother, who was sitting 20 feet away, bottom of the stairs watching television, and I knew the voice didn't come from there. I knew that she should have heard it. So I spun around rather than interact with it. I spun around and asked her if she could hear it, wanting the outer validation, I guess, at that point. She says, nope, didn't hear any voice. So I could not deny what happened, what I heard. And probably, you know, several months later, I started experimenting, probably shortly before my fifth birthday. And I started projecting that same voice out through, you know, out, I would stand in front of windows at night, the lights on in the house, can't see outside, and I would project that voice out telepathically, and I would wait for it to return. And it wasn't until I got completely silent and stopped thinking about it, that it finally did. And then we began developing this conversation, and, and to this day, I still have those conversations, different ways, different topics, much deeper relevance, and you know, for today than it had then. However, it was a quite a unique experience as a child in comparison to what you're talking with of how most of us 
have proceeded through that adolescent develop childhood and adolescent development. So I, I get it, and I agree with that from my own direct experience. I taught high school for five years, and you know there were very few students. I had fifty students sometimes in a classroom, and you know they were just being kids. There there was wasn't a whole lot of depth. There are questions about the nature of reality or their part in it. Of course, most of them do their biologicals, the parentage and, and their history and all of that. So there wasn't the need for the question. Well, you know, so yeah, no, and exactly. And, um, and I'm going to, you know, I mean, that's a great experience that you had that you've just shared with people. So this shows you some of, some of the differences that, you know, everybody's going to experience because, you know, your soul is here, you know, you're going to be reincarnated many, many, many times, you know, whether it's a hundred times, 500 times, a thousand times, I don't know the number, but, um, let's say 500 at the I moment said, until you get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> well, until, yeah. So, you know, and until you, um, you know, it's only through lessons of suffering will the journeying soul, um, gain self-knowledge to retain individuality after discarding the ego. Because we ask why because we ask why yeah how why is this happening to me what oh. it starts the question of, yeah, yeah yeah absolutely self-awareness okay the universe is going to say okay here's why yeah are you going to but pay only to but the only answer? if you're only if you're open to it yeah and so well, and not so, even that it will provide the answers regardless of whether you're open to it or not it's the choice of whether you receive and then integrate then uh, yeah yeah absolutely um so, but the ego, so the ego is a tool of creation to um, create individuality out of the unity of its wholeness. Mm -hmm. The ego is created at the time of conception and the soul is infused in that process. The ego uses the forces of uh, electromagnetism to build uh, to the uh, specified genetic plan uh, for every body. And we use the tools of electromagnetism. We think with electrical impulses in the brain. We feel with magnetic impulses in the nervous system. Your thinking is an electrical consciousness plan. Your, your magnetization, be it a happy feeling, a loving feeling, or a hateful, vengeful feeling, magnetizes this uh, consciousness plan into a blueprint. And we create thousands of these every day. And um, this is a blueprint of a future event or experience that will come into your life. And the more repeated thinking you have consistent with these uh, patterns of beliefs uh, and thinking that you have and these feelings, these uh, magnetic emotional feelings that you have, you create when this blueprint, you reinforce these blueprints. And when they get strong enough to magnetize to them a like experience or event, that comes into your life. And we do this moment by moment and we're ignorant of it. We're unknowing of it. And we don't know that this is what we're doing. But what we're doing is we're creating every event and every experience that comes to our life. And we're drawing these things to us to help us learn the lessons we want to learn, to feel what we want to feel, because this takes back this richness to the divine, mm -hmm. to because the divine is unconditional love. So it's so like another it, level of the law of attraction um, only a bit deeper in, in understanding of, of the mechanism that's really taking well, place. Well, yeah. So, you know, in my, so I'll talk about my book for a second. In my book, I share in 2011, how I unknowingly, ignorantly, and unwittingly did something every day for a year that manifested this $60,000 hardtop Lexus convertible in my life. And I thought, oh my God, I'm just lucky. This is quite amazing. Later in my book, I describe exactly the mechanics of the universe that we use moment by moment uh, and link that back to this thing I did every day that actually manifested that Lexus into my life. Now, we do this with things we like and we do it with things that we don't want and that mm -hmm. we don't like. Right, the mind and doesn't hear do or don't. It only has the subject. Well, so, <clears throat> yes, exactly. So the ego... You know, the only way the ego can draw things to you is through these forces of electromagnetism. So you bond with everything that you like. I like ice cream. I like chocolate cake. I like that kind of car. I want that kind of house. I want to travel to that place. I like that person. 
And so you bond with those through this uh, uh, attraction uh, bonding mechanism of electromagnetism. Things that we don't want and to create safety and security, we reject, we push it away. Uh, it is a repulsion aspect of electromagnetism. So I don't like that person. I don't like that event. I don't want to go there. These are things we all push away. These are the only mechanisms that the ego can use to create these experiences in our life. Your soul is always trying to prompt the ego through the psyche to return to unconditional love. But the ego can only bring these things that it experienced in the past uh, that brought it happiness through these forces of electromagnetism. So what we continue to do is we continue to push things away and draw things to us that we like and we re reinforce this with our thinking patterns. And, um, and so you know as well as I do, you know, you, you go, oh, I want that new car. And so you set a goal to get this new car, you go out, you work hard, you get this car. And it's, you're really happy about this car for a while, right? Like, it's just like, whoa, this is the most amazing thing ever. I'm so proud and happy of this car. And then that's, that's, um, you know, kind of joy starts to slowly die away. So you show it off to your friends, to get a little boost, you know, look at my new car, you know, and everybody's going, oh, yeah. And so that makes you feel better. But in the end, that will die away, it becomes mundane and boring. So you set another goal, you go after it, all you're doing is trying to draw these things to you to make you happy. And we're using all of our externalities is merely a, a mere reflection of our beliefs. You change your beliefs, you change what you see. Life Absolutely. is really, life Absolutely. is. Re and what you're talking about seemed to me, having been through similar processes and, and having had most of my life, at least exploring and, and, and reaching a greater understanding of this, that those outer accoutrements that we think we need or want to attract to ourselves, as you say, often become much less than fulfilling to us over time. And so there's something more. When I had my uh, awakening at 18, I, my parents had me see a psychiatrist. And, and one of the things that he said to me after assuring me I wasn't crazy. I'd gone through a spiritual awakening. Why so young? He wasn't sure because most people don't do it till their mid forties is what he said, if they ever do. And obviously he'd done some studies on this himself. So those kinds of things is kind of what you're talking about, about that range where we have, first of all, in, in mid forties, you know, the empty nesters comes about for most people. So there's another desire for what's next in life. And then there's also that maturation process of having some fulfillment of the earthly goals, like you're talking about the car, the house, the boat, the toys, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like, okay, now that, that you lose interest with that afterwards. Like, I mean, sometimes you can continue with that and be happy, maybe. But I would think that over time, it's like, there's still something more, right? Which is what you're alluding to. So carry on. What was next? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So, you know, life is really a journey within. All of the peace, the safety, the security, the love, the joy, the prosperity, the abundance that you are seeking, it's all inside you. It's got nothing to do with what's outside you. It's got nothing to do with your material wealth. It's got nothing to do with what you own and who your friends are or anything else. It's all inside you. And when you make this connection back with the divine, with God, with source, whatever you want to call it, when you make this connection back with, with the divine, you begin this process of dissolving these bondages of the ego and allowing your soul to gain mastery of your life. And when your soul can gain mastery of your life, you will begin to uh, experience and project unconditional love to everyone and everything in your environment. I call when, that the ego transcending to we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Because when you're in that place and, and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, you're connected to everything. You are connected right? so to everything. That's a we in that place because you're no longer just you you are still individuated and yet you're connected because you make that leap in awareness 
because of the work that you've done and then what is reflected back to you from both inner and outer perspectives right yeah, so, symbiosis of that yeah so um yeah no i i get what you're saying there so we now we're back to this um dictionary and language and different language and coming to a common understanding yeah. so <laughs> it's great um, isn't it yeah 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 oh of course absolutely um so you know your soul is a fragment of divine consciousness your soul is a fragment of the unity of the divine after you know this body is ephemeral and it'll go back when you die it goes back to dust but your soul's infinite and eternal and moves um, back into the divine now there the, are some different opinions about that based on several accounts throughout history jesus being one of them that we don't have to leave our bodies behind and that we can reach that level of consciousness where we can take our bodies with us but that's a much deeper disciplined lifestyle than i aware that we have available to actually understand and live at this point i may be wrong that may be available we just haven't developed the science to understand it yet right? so and and i'm going to say that if you follow that not you don't necessarily have to do this but if you anyone follows these seven steps you will understand that jesus is actually saying that's a ridiculous human notion that is a man-made concept what would somebody want to do with their body in heaven well i would disagree with that based on everything that i've read as well and and, and so here's part of the intellectual humility and, and psychological safety that we have here um you know there are multiple accounts of events that dispute what you just said uh the, people mm -hmm. byron spaulding took a trip with a bunch of scientists to southeast asia in the 1920s and and they recorded uh several events like i'm speaking about of uh, by location of people disappearing reappearing um and so these things and here's some scientists who you know were bound and determined to figure out they'd heard these things they wanted to go find out for themselves and they did so these records are available as well and so the, the discounting of that uh as silly humanness i it's possible for sure anything's possible from my experience i, I would have to politely disagree with it based on what i know and, and what my own direct experience is of having bilocated and teleported myself in in my early days so i've had direct experience of those things that kind of indicate that there's something more um, so, uh, and, you know, I think that probably not productive for both of us to go back and forth that we can, uh, we can agree sure. to I mean, have a different, different perspective. Oh, yeah, we, that, so. Which is all part of where we're, you know, why we're having these discussions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we yeah. need to have, you know, just let's look at how we are and, and what we found and what, uh, experiences we've had and, and see if we can find some commonality in those somewhere that we can build from yeah and um and so i'll just let me say that everything that i'm sharing today is not from me mm. i am not i am merely the messenger so okay. so uh um, i tend so to correlate thing with my direct experience otherwise i don't believe it yeah no fair enough and uh i have a direct experience as well but it's still not from this ego <laughs> it is from you know it's from a different uh perspective it's from well, the, the yeah, unity it's of the consciousness I'll, I'll yeah yeah <laughs> it's from uh, unity uh, of consciousness not from me okay. so um uh, unless we say you know if we're talking about souls then yes but if we're talking about ego in this human personality no <laughs> Oh, no oh, it, because uh, the level of consciousness that has to be attained acquired ascended to um there is that state of unity you know it's like um another dear friend uh dudley lynch wrote a book called mother of all minds and he presents in that that we have traditionally been in an alpha chassis and alpha uh, mind 
right? It's steeped in competition and um, bipolarism. And that now some have the beta mind is what he calls it, still in the alpha chassis, but the beta mind at least grocks oneness. Mm -hmm. Isn't necessarily able to operate in it yet. It understands the concept and is open to the experience of that, which is kind of where, you know, the reason we're having this conversation, right, is how can mm -hmm. we reach this state of understanding of this unity consciousness and learn how to work together better in the physical world in order to assist humanity in its own evolutionary process, which we are in, obviously. Oh, yeah, 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 that's exactly, yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, so, uh, what was it, you know, you were just saying something there. So, uh, so th the theta, uh, theta part is just before you fall asleep or just when you wake up theta wavelength. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you, in this process that I share in my book, you will be taught how to, um, uh, you know, to stop all thoughts and all thinking. And this is the, you know, kind of in this theta state. And that is the state where you can initially start to make this connection with um, our source of being. Mm -hmm. And um, so as you progress in this over time, you can get into that theta state, um, you know, even during waking hours and stuff like that. So you can get inspiration and direction, uh, you know, pretty much any time of the day right. and uh, to help you with this process, this evolutionary process of the soul. I'm so, sure that that's really a, a great process. And, and for an engineer and, and the, those of you who need processes, it's probably, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, as a teenager, I found another way that I've used my entire life and, and teach my coaching uh, clients whenever possible. And that's simply to put your fingertips together and feel your heartbeat in them. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and then, because when you can, when you're feeling your heartbeat in your fingertips, you're officially out of your mind. You're not thinking, you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the more you focus on deepening your breath and focusing on the heartbeat, you can feel your entire body pulse. And just beyond that is where you enter the theta stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which still it takes some just one practice to do so, um, but you can do it anywhere. You know, you can, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, exactly. You can sit in a meeting, and yeah. and have that process once you've practiced it enough to really clear yourself and, and just be available to what needs to happen in the moment and be able to serve it from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, there's different ways to do this. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, and yeah, some, yeah, yeah. Some need really, you know, hardcore structure. Right, the rituals. Oh, yeah, and, and I and think like so. So don't misinterpret. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the process I went through of learning the new knowledge, going through this process to be able to have the spiritual awakening is the process. Part of that process is just helping you get to this point where you know you you need to. Or at least I needed to start in meditation to get to this point where you make connection back with the divine. Right. So I can do that. I can do that. I don't have to be in a meditative state now to do that. I can do that at any time. Practice, that, huh? that, that's the benefit of practice. So yeah. in a conversation, I can just take a moment in that conversation, be quiet, and I can be in that state. Mm -hmm. So, and that then allows this connection back with the divine to help you in that moment. I mean, our goal here, you're not here to please God. You are here to express God and God is unconditional love. And unconditional love is, you know, this expression of unconditional love to everyone and everything this is the transition that, you know, will eventually happen around the globe. And this is what will bring us into this new era of love and peace. And I would offer this too, because, you know, this kind of stuff, and I'm right with you, but to others, it sounds really woo-woo, just way out there, right? But the thing is, by operating in this new living awareness, it doesn't change the physical structures of the world much at all. What it does change is how we interact with them and each other. Exactly. And that collective collaboration 
which allows you were talking about the genetic code and, and the specific purpose of which we are incarnate for and we may not or we may or may not know what that is but how i see that is that when you find that place you're talking about it allows your perfected form fit and function in the world to begin to appear and surface so that you can acquiesce to it and perform it and, and it's usually inclusive of all your life experience and the skill set that you have you're just applying it slightly differently and you find more joy and happiness with it as a result you find that to be true oh yeah 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 totally so you know this analogy that i use is that um to say you know essentially the same thing but just to give people a different perspective is uh you know you you come into this world and we're like method actors and we adopt the role we dress the role we speak the role whether we're on film or whether we're uh you know practicing for that when the director calls action right now now the difference between an actor and what we do as as people is that an actor will you know take on that method acting experience for you know a few weeks or a month to really get into the role then they're starting the filming the director calls action they get into the role they're in the role they call cut they can come out of that and go oh man you did a great job i really felt that when you said it like that and you really nailed that part the right. problem is that the ego because it takes control of construction of our body and development of our uh, human experience we believe that this body is our reality we believe that what we think is true and right and wrong and good and bad and in reality this body is just that method actor and when you understand that you live in this duality and your soul is your reality and this ego is just our method actor this body this physical form you get to a place where you can step out of that ego as a matter of fact your goal is to actually just let the operate this vehicle in this world but be this expression of your soul of unconditional love and, and again it's a trend it, it doesn't do away with ego it oh, no. evolves it to a new level of functionality the ego there's nothing the ego is a divinely ordained tool it is nothing to be condemned it is what keeps you uh draws to you what you need to survive and uh creates these uh protective mechanisms of safety and security to help you feel secure and to ensure you move out of the way of that you know bus that's about to hit you until and you realize that by being in that place of fearlessness vulnerability openness unconditional love which there really is no protection in that place because you don't need it you don't need it yeah no you don't and so you you know it's just the thing is that when you actually understand all these mechanisms and you understand how and why the universe came about and how we use these tools moment by moment and then you begin you begin this process and you follow this process and you start to shed these bondages of the of the uh, ego you come to a place where you actually understand why everybody does exactly what they do and you understand why they're doing it and all of the reprehensible things that they're doing you understand their soul is perfect their soul is equal to your soul their soul is unconditional love and all this reprehensible stuff is just their ego being in control of that situation and creating the experiences that that soul wants to learn and wants to experience to actually make its way back to the light right right and so you don't judge anybody anymore you don't judge anything anymore there's no negativity there's no judgment there's no good or bad there's no right or wrong it's just the process and that's what you see and then what you want to do is you want to express unconditional love in that situation to try and help that soul wake up to begin this process mm -hmm. uh, it's funny uh, and quite synchronistic the um live and let live movement that I'm uh, the executive director of now the the two aspects of that kind of fall into even Tom Campbell right and I'm sure you're familiar with him he talks he writes and talks about 
translating a right brain thinker into a left brain, you know, how a, a right brain person operates in left brain terms, right? To try and bridge that gap. And he talks about avatars and the same kinds of things that you're, you talk about as far as our ability to choose and manifest our reality from that perspective. Um, the live and let live, it, it's obviously there's two aspects of that, live and let live. Live, you like this when it's more of an engineering type. It's addressing aggression and the removal of it through the laws and leg legislation that has allowed it to be there. So this is kind of a similar thing of the ego pushing for what it wants. Well, that's not good. You know, the, it, politicians and countries still allow this aggressive behavior. And we see that it's, it's occurring now. And then the, and so the only way we can address that is through the legal and legislative system, because that's where it's, that's where it's allowed. That's the original starting point of that. Then there's no other movement that I'm aware of that's ever done this. Now the let live side is what you're talking about, the unconditional, you know, as long as you're not aggressing, you live your life, you're, you're uh, our founder, uh, Mark Victor says, you're the iron-fisted dictator of your life, your property, your money, your behavior, whatever that is, and you have the absolute right and free agency to do or be anything you want, as long as you don't aggress. Yeah, as long, yeah, exactly. As long as you are not doing anything harmful to anybody else, anything right. that's contrary to unconditional love. Anybody else, including the planet, because the planet, including the planet, including animals and yeah. insects and everything, any right. living species and even the planet. Which is interesting. You know, you were talking about reading the the books that you had in order to gain the the entrance, right? Um, after I had my experience, I got this deluge of material: Vedas, Rig Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Quran. Bible. I'd already read the Bible a couple of times before that. Urantia book, uh, which is another 2,000 page, really heady <laughs> book. And yet they all offered this same wisdom and knowledge of how to acquiesce to the greater part of you that deserves to be present and operational in the world because that's where true happiness is found. Yeah, it, it, everything, you know, Jesus said, uh, uh, what was his language? The kingdom of heaven is within. Yep. And so it is. It is your soul. And when you let your soul express itself through this physical body without any influence or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? without any uh intervention intervention of the okay. ego um you will express unconditional love and all of that safety and security that you're looking for that peace that abundance that prosperity it's all within you it's got nothing to do with your external environment and yet it starts showing up in your external environment because once you've reached that place you begin magnetizing to others who are also in a similar place well, you become this beacon of light. Yeah, exactly. You become this beacon of light that draws other people to you. And all of those things, you know, you... Or you're drawn to them. Yeah, or you're drawn to them. And you will manifest all kinds of things that come into your life. But it, you will be doing it from this spiritually enlightened center, which is you'll never be wanting to manifest things for yourself. It's always things that are going to be Absolutely. good for your your family your community, your country, the world. Now I'm going to reference it, if I may, I'm going to digress for just a moment and maybe digress and elevate simultaneously um, and reference that experience I had in the marching orders that I was given about the points of light that I was to work with in order to facilitate a new world order, that it would happen in my lifetime. Now that sounds just absolutely bonkers, no. especially back <laughs> then. Back oh, yeah, then. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now... Yeah it alludes to okay now there you know we're many of us are acquiescing to that divine purpose that we have and living it so 47 years of prep now put me in place to where i could you know the, the organization was already created it has 30 chapters in 19 countries 
and I was asked to become the executive director of it, which is a perfect fulfillment of my destiny to date that I've ever had. And the accoutrements that came with that are everything that I've ever desired. And the fulfillment transcends any kind of fear that I may have experienced or even the, the sense of, oh my God, here's this daunting process now that I've prepared for and it's in front of me, what do I do? Well, what I found is, is and, and I'm sure you'll relate to this, you continue doing the same thing. You embrace it, you give in to it. It shows you what needs to be done. That information will come through in, in all kinds of different ways with seren serendipitous moments, synchronistic events. Um, I started saying random occurrences, as, as you and I both know. There well, are it's no only random there's, occurrences. Yeah, and there's no random don't occurrence. see the connectivity yet. Yeah, exactly. In it. Exactly. So all of these exactly. things are happening and, and the silver lining of, of this last ex two years that we've had where the outer world, the outer ego, if you will, and mass has wanted us to uh, become obsessive on self hygiene and sequestrate and become fearful of everybody and, and each other and basically separate and hibernate. Well, now everybody, not everybody, but many are saying, okay, we're done with this. This is all ridiculous. I want to be with people. I want to do something better in my life. And there's this opening to all kinds of different opportunities that are happening for people. As a result, virtual communities are happening, even on ground community, communities are developing. So this has given us the opportunity to evolve collectively in how we manage ourselves and our world in a better way. Now it's, yeah, we don't have all the answers, it, that's obvious. However, we're willing to have these kind of conversations like you and I are right now to, to kind of see where, see where we're at, find a common place, develop a, a, at least a common understanding. We may not use the same language to get there. However, it's not necessarily the content, it's the context mm -hmm. that we're in. Right, yeah. and that energetic field of our intention, where we're putting our attention, intention, interaction, in order to create this more um, resonant field between us. Har harmonious. Yeah. Joyous. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, um, I'll, so let me share this. Is you know, it's kind of it's it's part of this whole package, right, of stuff. But you just said something that twigged on this for me and reminded me to mention this. So, you know, individually we create through our thinking and feeling, we create all of these events and experiences that come into our life and anything that is contrary to unconditional love. So things like um, judgment, denigration, slander, you know, lying, cheating, all of those things are negative and contrary to unconditional love. And there's a specific list of things that at a much um, lower vibratory rate. They are. And uh, there's this in the process that I talk about in my book, it's how to cleanse these things and then rebuild your consciousness hmm. uh, with, with uh, uh, the golden aspirations of divine consciousness. Think this is things that are congruent and consistent with where you come from. So, and what, so if I could ask, you know, I, I understand that and you're really wanting to share some, some knowledge and wisdom here, but from your personal experience, what's, how did that affect your process in moving from the place of near suicide to near elation a year later what, oh, what because were, because there is okay. something that that you can well, identify then, and share with on a, on a personal level yeah so can i answer that question in a second let me just sure, finish the sure. thought i'm on absolutely so we, so we individually uh, create every event and every experience that comes into our life. What you consume, so if you think nutrition is good for your body, and it is the right nutrition, what you feed your mind is more important for your overall health and well being. So if you are always consuming, you know, negative media and violent films and denigrating murderous activities, 
these are the things that reinforce your thinking and your feeling behaviors and patterns of thinking. And these are the kinds of things that uh, reinforce your activity and your behavior in the world and create these events and experiences. When collectively we are all focused on these negative things, we create this stuff that will be manifested. It's a law of cause and effect. What's already put in motion will come into manifested form. So things that have been happening over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years, they will come into manifested form. They, it doesn't matter. The whole world could change its thinking right now. That will still come into manifested form. It is a law of cause and effect. So things are going to get a lot worse before they get a lot better. Like being in a sales funnel, you know, layer by yeah, layer. Exactly. It, it, has yeah. to, it has to happen. Yeah. And, and just like, you know, whether it was 9-11, COVID, these things were in place to happen because it set us up to recognize where we were first or where we are. And then to, okay, where do we go from here? This is not what we want. Right. Well, this now is, we've got but, the science and understanding to be able to do it. Yeah. So, so this, you got to be clear. There's, there's, in my opinion, there is mm -hmm. no God that's sending anything to us. This is through our own collective thinking and feeling that we, we create this stuff. With each other, we, we are co-creators. And so we are responsible for this. You are responsible for it. This is, this is a conversation of total accountability. So let's talk about an individual, mm -hmm. anything that comes into your life, good or bad, you have created it and you need to get to a point where you understand this. So this process that I outline in my book, the first thing I had to do as an engineer uh, is understand that everything I thought, be it right or wrong, good or bad, true or false, is really just a belief. And for an engineer, and, man, that had to be a real struggle temporarily. Possibly. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I've got an engineering or semi-engineering background too. I mean, you're looking at process and protocol and cause and effect right. and recognizing all the different patterns. Then the, the and what we have a tendency to do is be self-deprecating in the processes. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And all that stuff is destructive to yourself. Absolutely. So, yeah. so yeah. first thing I had to do was recognize that what I thought as right or wrong, good or bad, true or false, is really just a belief. And as soon as you understand that that's just a belief, that means now you have a little fissure opening up that if, if you have the right process, you can understand, well, then if that's just a belief, I can actually change my beliefs, but you need well, a process to do that. I use the term suspend your belief, right? Just don't believe anything and question and then build your experience base which gives you an experience system rather than a belief system and the belief system is just much bs anyway yeah well it, and again this is all you know kind of divinely ordained as the souls on this evolutionary process over mm -hmm. you know well, we many, have many, to, many, even many though it's divinely right? and ordained and all that kind of stuff prophetic revelatory apocalyptic in nature like we're talking which, <laughs> which actually yeah, means yeah. uncovering knowledge it doesn't mean you know, the world comes to an end. That, that's just, that, but it's funny how people, you'll ask nine out of 10 people and they'll probably give you the answer. Oh, it's the end of the world. Hmm. So what it does do is it gives the opportunity to adjust to a different um, awareness, right? You're, yeah. you ask questions, you test the truth, you test what you think is the truth, you whack away at it, you, you test as an engineer, right? You go through the, the testing process or your beta versions or your theta versions or the delta versions and however many versions you come to, uh, certainly not Omicron, but in the <laughs> process of doing so, you get a finer and finer detailed version of what and how you interact with reality in a more practical and pragmatic way because that's really what we need we don't need the etheric we don't need the esoteric although that's great and it's there and it's given us the foundation from which to work from however we're condensed into these forms so we need to condense all that information into a practical and pragmatic application in the world otherwise it's pretty useless 
I agree a hundred percent. And so this is the, the, and so, uh, you know, without harping on about this, this is what's in my book is I've put all of this in understandable language that people will understand. It's based in science, but it's in concepts so that, and everybody knows what I'm talking about. It's just put together in a way which opens them up. Which I'd be careful with the term everybody. I thought that. Okay. Well, time, most people. You know, yeah. Everybody put it this understand way. what's it's going on. And I find out there's very few who really do. I'll put it this way. Uh, for people that are ready, this will op- this will allow them to, and they're ready to begin this process. It will take them through this foundational process of laying a foundation to be able to accept sure. this new new information and new knowledge that I share that is, again, logical and rational and believable. And you begin that process and you begin this, this seven step process to actually rebuild your consciousness. So we, we are not matter imbued with consciousness. We are consciousness made visible through the descent of vibrational frequency of electrical particles. Condensed into form. We are consciousness. Everything that you see, touch, feel, hear, know is consciousness. Awareness. We're 99% space. You know, exactly. when, I was, when I asked what the Trinity was, I was taken to a place in, uh, across the universe, of, for lack of a better, and three spheres uh, appeared and uh, had a, a dozen small green spheres in orbit around it, or what appeared to be, and they were maybe one fiftieth the size of, of the three spheres. And, and uh, they took one voice and said to me, we are not only your forefathers, we're also the forefathers of your solar system. And my guide who had taken, given me the, the journey there, I started to ask questions because I, I got radical curiosity in my blood, right? He says to me, oh, that's it. You got all you need. You'll figure it out. Well, the first thing that came to mind is that, that being the macro, we're now looking at, okay, where's the micro and, and the proton, electron, and neutron that are probably at least one version of that and that that 99% space ratio means that there's a consciousness. There's something in there that's managing the configurations of those elements, those trinitized elements, if you will, the into form. And the more we understand that, that's where I'm, that's where the whole concept of being able to move, you know, move your body from one dimension to another and and be able to you know take your body with you so so to speak um so there's you know there's at least this a semi-logical path to that possibility right and and so those things are are coming into a new awareness a new uh capacity for us to explore and expand and, and even integrate with what you're saying now what i find though um, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, that there's a certain uh, collection of folks that we tend to have similar uh, vibrations with or, or uh, resonance to, and that those tend to have clusters, let's say, and, and so those people would be the ones that would be apt to follow or find you and, and be attracted or magnetized to the information in your book. There's many others who do similar things and so there are you know the old adage there's many paths to the top of the mountain the fact is that we get to the top of the mountain and we share in that space of how we got there to kind of confirm that we all are on at least we're in the same chapter if not same page and then figure out okay now where do we take this because this is a new area for all of us that we're just exploring together and how can we evolve in a new way to create a harmony among people and planet in our time? And I think that's really what we're facing in the next 10 to 15 years, actually. Um, there's a uh, gentleman named Wilbert Smith who ran Canada's UFO investigation program in the 1950s, well-respected scientist. The program was funded by the Ministry of Transportation, so it was a legitimate program. It wasn't just some, you know, guy fell off the turnip truck. Uh, But what Wilbert had was conversations with people from elsewhere is what he called them. A couple of things that they identified as misgivings in the human consciousness. And one was that we live both, we live half inside, 
and half outside. And that's evidentiary of what you're saying. The other is that time to them is a measurement of the change in entropy. So that would indicate as we learn to work together in harmony, entropy decreases and we can get more done in less time. Because there's this fear that we're not going to have time to do what we need to in order to prepare us for these coming, you know, climate changes and whatnot. Right. So this uh, gives yeah. an indication that, you know, that's actually, it is possible that we are in the right place at the right time. And we do have enough time to make things happen because we're, we're prepared to things, for things to happen because we have the understanding that we're capable of it. So, um, well said. And, and for me, I'll tell you that I'm not concerned. Because oh, I'm not saying that I'm concerned. Uh, uh, I'm no, just, no, 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 no. We need I'm, not be concerned. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. But I'm just going to, the language I would use for that for me will be, you know, I'm not concerned because everything is coming together as it, as it will come together, as it rightfully needs to come together to create this transition. And so... One might call that perfection. Yes, exactly. One might. And so, um, you know, yeah, no, that's great. Um, oh, there was something else I was going to, I was going to answer your other question and I've forgotten what it was now. Oh gosh, I forgot what the question was too. It was there and then, well, at least it was asked. So it's out in the thought yeah. atmosphere somebody, it, it, someplace, it and someone will answer it, I'm sure, or, or at least yeah. you know, it'll trigger some thoughts in others, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. one of the highlights of having apocalyptic chats is yeah. being able to share and compare and learn from each other and grow and, you know, and, uh, and expand the thoughtmosphere. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so wherever you are in this process, you are exactly where you need to be. So don't, you know, kind of chide yourself or denigrate yourself yeah, or, yourself. you know, think That's... badly. Of self. You, you've got to not do that. You have to understand you're exactly where you need to be. And, and self-love is actually the, the core of the beginning of that. And, and so... I believe that, you know, what we need to talk about is that when we say self-love, we're not talking about um, your, the little I mind of ego. We're talking about the soul and your soul is love. And so you need to just let that express itself. And you have to, you've got to get to this place where you actually understand this body is not your reality. This body is just this rented vehicle. And your the little eye mind of ego is not the master of mm -hmm. your world. If you are having a, a thought which is negative, judgmental about yourself or about others, that is the ego. That is not the soul. And that you're the master of your mind. The mind Absolutely. is not the master of you. Or let's put it in even in the uh, more physical terms. Your brain is a tool. How you use it is up to you. It will do whatever you ask it to. Absolutely. And so, you know, I used to think that everything I thought was in my brain, you know, something I experienced, something that yeah, I had yeah, learned, yeah. whatever, right? And then I came to this awareness that no, you know, it's consciousness is throughout my whole body. And then I became aware of no, really, you know, consciousness is really the stream of stuff that goes by me. And I pick a thought out in a nanosecond, I examine it. And I go, oh, I like that thought. It could be a loving thought, it could be a hateful thought, but I like it. It's consistent with my patterns of thinking and feeling. So I adopt it, I take it. Things that I didn't like, I throw back in the stream and away it goes. And Just have this vision, right? Check this out. So if, imagine the body surrounded by a torus of electromagnetic energy and we're just playing bumper cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're here, we're, we're like, you know, like I said earlier, we're these actors, we're, we're playing, we're in this part. And so now I know that, you know, and you're thinking, so just for people that, you know, maybe haven't read any of this stuff, you're thinking with uh, these electromagnetic impulses, you think with electrical impulses in the brain, you feel with magnetic impulses in this nervous system. What you think about affects the expression of a cell, you will draw illness to that cell or you will prone promote its well-being if you Lipton has spent a lifetime investigating and proving that exactly and that's all documented in science and so 
this is this whole thing of if you can understand that what you think is right or wrong, good or bad, true or false is really just a belief. And you can understand that what you think about every thought you have of every moment of every day is either affecting your health in a positive or a negative way is bringing experiences to you that you like or that you don't like. And when you can understand this and then you get a process that allows you to go through this, to cleanse yourself, to rebuild yourself and to get your thinking in alignment with from where we come from, you start to promote the health and well-being of your body. You start to, to, to be this beacon of light for others to be attracted to, to want to learn more. Don't push your way or your beliefs on anybody else. This is if they're interested and they want to learn, share. And if they don't, don't hold your peace. It's not for you to try and force your will or your way on anybody else. Okay. And Again, so that's aggression, right? Again, that's aggression. Absolutely. That's a, I'm right. You're wrong. You know, yeah. there's no, there's no right or wrong here. It's only a process. It's only, we're actors again. So, you know, get outside of this and, and take this journey within. And if you can take this journey within and you have this process, you will make this connection back with the divine. And then your life becomes divinely orchestrated. You get it. You get instructions or messages or movies, however it comes to you. And it'll come to you in different ways. There'll be moments of inspiration. You'll be thinking about some mundane thing and all of a sudden you'll be inspired. And what you need to do is get to this point where you understand and trust that what you have been given free will and but your goal here is to allow the divine's will to be done in you and through you so when you get inspiration to do something and it seems like oh my god that's taking me to a place i don't want to go i can tell you if you can trust it and believe it and heed it and follow it there's more blessings and love and peace that'll come into your life than you ever dreamed possible absolutely totally agree with it and whether whether you or, I, or anyone in the audience believes that, don't. Don't worry about the belief. Test it. And until you do, you won't really know because you're still standing outside of it. And the ability to let go of whatever fears you're ha having that's keeping you from doing so is exactly what's in the way of you doing so. Yeah, and and you know, and yeah, I agree with you 100%. And, you, and it's hard to do, well, I put it this way, I found it really hard to do without having a process for doing it. Mm -hmm. Or a but, partner you know, in it. Or a, a partner in it. Yeah. Um, but you still need to fundamentally change these uh, belief patterns that you have, and you need this process to do this. But I can tell and there you- There is an you, aspect of fun in the mentalness. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, all fun. right, Neil. Well, hey, it's all good. Um, I, I, I totally enjoyed this conversation. We had some wonderful moments of, you know, kind of being in uh, a state of flux and we found our way through it. Perfect example of what we're talking about, right? To be willing to, to be in that place. And I sorely appreciate that. Um, and I really loved the time with you and our conversation. I appreciate it. And you're yeah, well, and right back at you. I, I very much appreciate having this conversation with you today. And it's a pleasure meeting you. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, you're absolutely can, welcome. Your information just, will be in the description underneath the video. So I'll have your links and your website, your book, all that kind of stuff for our audience to take a look at and explore further. Perfect. And right. uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Cool. Thanks again. And Thank namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us through this episode of One World in a New World. I've been your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time.